what I've been trying to do recently, and I'll show you, I guess this is a little taste of something new. I've been, was working on sort of a, um, a pitch for a film trailer, so I can show you. So I have some of those kind of bass sounds in it, um, and, uh, but then just against sort of your stereotypical trailer kind of sounds. So this will probably be a bit louder, so let's see. Uh, So like that sort of thing where I'm trying to mix like those big noisiest style bass sounds but with something that's very cinematic and moody. Um, I mean they'd sort of uh, tread on that territory a little bit but I was, this is for a trailer so I was trying to go for that, that vibe. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's so far all I've, I've been able to do with these new, this whole new series of bass sounds but I can't wait to, to actually you know, write some music with them or incorporate them. Um, and uh, let's see, it also, because I, the reason why I'm spending time on this is I do feel like this is really an important aspect of what I do and and like of what I think I can pass along is is that spending the time in, in creating your sounds because um, I reuse them all the time too like you don't it's like and once you have your own library of sounds you know you can, you can reuse them because then instead of it being ripping off yourself you're just you're creating like signatures or that's how I rationalize it um, but uh, so like this sound is a guitar based pad that I use um, again all the time in, in almost everything. And in different octaves it sounds good. Uh, let's see. Okay, part of the problem is it's set in mono and unison. But, so I can play different notes here. And the idea with this is, I was listening to uh, Nine Inch Nails' Warm Place, and the, the intro to that has some kind of looping guitar tremolo part, like where it's being picked and repeated. It's really beautiful. Um, so I wanted to come up with something similar like that. So I just played a part that's similar, and, and I have it looping. Um, but also when you play it in higher octaves, it takes on sort of a crystallized kind of sound, um, which is nice. So in a lot of stuff, I have sounds that are based on this in the background, like um, probably the majority of the tracks on Emergence have it, anything new that I've worked on um, or other projects like for other people, <laughs> I use this sound all the time. And so the time that it took to do it, which was several hours at the time, maybe felt like a waste of time, but it's ended up, it ends up saving you a lot of time. And that's why I, th I really think like, you know, spending time on your sound design is, is, is very, very well worth it. Another one um, here that I really like too, is this is just one note from um, when I did a uh, remix of Transgenic, like we did sort of, I, um, um, we sort of remixed our, our version of it uh, and I have like this guitar bass pad in it and I liked one note in it a lot. Uh, let's see, let me find the octave. Just kind of a moody note, it makes me think of like aliens or, and so this is something I, I use this note a lot. <laughs> um, so that's another thing too, like I'll, I'll mine through the tracks that are already done and look for things that I can pull out to, to use for future, future stuff as well. Yeah, um, so, in, so most of it like in this case is, I mean there's lots of guitars in that. In terms of the drums, um, you know the clicks and things are just programmed like similar to like what I showed in Parks on Fire. In terms of any sort of live drum sounds, most of those are cut from that uh, Sean Lee's Planet of the Breaks, like where the drum sounds start from like a loop in that. Because I like to do the, you know, just like you do with vinyl, like if you sampled a beat and then you cut it up and make a whole new beat out of it. Um, I'm a little too afraid to sample from vinyl <laughs> in terms of like, you know, worried about like just the legal issues of, of uh, you know, sampling someone else's music. So, you know, um, uh, like Planet of the Breaks, it's like it's they sound sounds really good. I love the drum sounds in it, so I use that a lot of the time as starting material to then slice up. Or, or I've made even um, I don't have them on this computer, but kits of of drum sounds from that 
Yeah. This is a bit off topic, but I'm just curious, um, what exactly all do you do for a living? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there, it's a couple things. So it's it's uh, uh, teach at PureMind, and then um, it's I do a lot of session work as actually a guitar player. Um, so I, I did all the guitars for Assassin's Creed 2 and for Borderlands, um, so video game stuff like that. And um, then we also license our some of our music catalog uh, to things. Like we've had Transgenic was in CSI this year. We licensed some things to CSI two years ago. Um, Parks on Fire has been in Top Gear, BBC's Top Gear, uh, twice. Um, so a lot of licensing of things. And then um, I also just, you know, collaborate with other people too. Like there's a, a, a guy I work with in Berkeley that just composes music for commercials. And so I work with him on <laughs> making music for commercials sometimes of like, you know, Priceline, like doing cheesy spy music or whatever. But whatever needs to happen, like, you know, it's... Um, to, to support the habit of making the music that, you know, want to make. So, uh, yeah. Do you happen to know which episodes of Talk Gear you're reviewing? <laughs> um, yeah, it's episode 13, I think, of season 9 or 10. Uh, I'm not sure. It's actually, but it is on the internet. Like, you can type in Trifonic and Top Gear, and, and people have it, um, have figured it out. But it's funny, because some of that stuff, too, depending on, you know, w how you go about that, like, uh, the in terms of... of um, licensing like we didn't even know about it until it happened like people told us like oh i heard parks and fire and top gear and like oh okay <laughs> you know because if you know there's companies and stuff that you know like where they'll um it's non-exclusive agreements well they'll try to to you know license material on your behalf but you give them permission basically to to figure out the contract and then a lot of times they don't notify you you just get like royalties on something or um uh, well no so like well we're BMI in terms of our publishing, um, but uh, it, th it, there's like companies like Rumblefish and um, I don't know Getty Images that they, where they do like basically like they try to license music and things like that. But they take a really big cut, um, which is typical. I mean that's that's how it, that's how it sort of works. Um, but yeah, so the, the living is I mean just like any musicians, like you certainly don't get into it for making a living. Well, I mean, you have to make a living, but like for the point of making like a really comfortable living, it's I think it's that's a very challenging. It's it's like, you know, sometimes things are really good and other times it's um, you know, it's certainly it's difficult, but um I'm learning that it's really the variety just doing a variety of things, like, you know, a combination of teaching, of creating music that can generate money, just doing whatever commercial projects that need to get done that, you know, um and uh, and but from each of those different avenues, you learn different things and you gain new experience, and it gives you more perspective. I think when you come back to just music, um, so I mean, I definitely I like teaching a lot uh, because it's like then it well it forces me to to learn new things and make sure that I sort of know what I'm talking about, <laughs> and then um, and then also you know it's usually feel inspired. Whereas sometimes like if you work on music all day, like. And then you go to work on your own music, like if you're working on something else, like a commercial, and you work on it all day long. The kind of last thing you want to do is spend another few hours in front of your computer making something that you want to make. You just, you know, feel burnt out. So the, the nice thing about doing stuff that's sort of related, but that's not exactly music making, is that, um, you know, it's that that I can feel inspired to to make the music, and you know, it's and and even after a full day, come back and like feel excited about making some music, making some progress, so, yeah. Um, so, let's see, I think in terms of that, the, like, kits and sound stuff, um, I think that's probably it in terms of that. So, what I want to do is show you a little bit of the song Lies, um, which I'll play you first just so you, uh, in case you haven't heard it, um, and can talk a little bit about that process and a little bit about, like, um, what's happening with the vocals and, um, you know, sort of how I sometimes like to approach processing, which is similar to the, you know, um, the way I do it with other other things as well. Um, so I'll just play you lies real quick so you can hear that. Um. When you walked away, it was the saddest day.
um, <laughs> so yeah, that song was like turned out really nice, and um, that's uh, our friend Amelia that's singing on that. Amelia June, she's like amazing singer songwriter. Um, so it's uh, definitely helps when you have a good vocalist. It's makes it makes the, the the work a lot easier in terms of getting everything to work out. The funny thing too, then uh, this this track was licensed to a 90210 promo. <laughs> It was like really melodramatic. It was really funny to, to watch it do that. Anyway, um, so um, this song, uh, I'll show you sort of where this started, this idea, and, and how that evolved. Um, and uh, with this one, um, Lawrence started the uh, chord progression on this. He actually, Lawrence also, he wrote the lyrics and the melody for it. Um, so it's, uh, it's pretty much, that's why it's like, pretty awesome song like I can't write lyrics at all and so um, this uh, yeah so this this track uh, he started basically um, and when we did this song this was before we did or we started this before we started like Parks on Fire and that sort of thing um, and so at the time we kind of didn't know what we were going to do because like um, sort of we're thinking that we do something more in the rock direction because um, I just came moved back from from working at BT studio and I was kind of like oh electronic like I wanted to do electronic but I wanted something more rock based because I just just was getting I don't know just feeling a little burnt so um, we started in sort of this direction with, um, and then then quickly things developed in a different direction over time <laughs> but um, but this track started as, as uh, you know, just as the mood for it is in these pads here. Um, I don't remember what the content was. It's either piano or guitar, um, but it was on, this was on the ASR-10, right? Is that, were these, these pads, do you know what, was it a guitar or piano sample in there? Yeah, so it was either piano or guitar, and then it's that we have an ASR-10 sampler, and just, it has like a nice reverb on it, so. Uh, Lawrence made these pads on the, the um, ASR-10, um, and so it kind of sets a nice mood. And then in terms of the drums, I, th I think these were just programmed in BFD, but we didn't end up really keeping them. Um, so I'll skip ahead. Um, so then usually the next step, kind of similar to Parks on Fire, is like, you know, like kind of like, all right, how do I expand this idea? So for me, it's usually like, all right, I'll play some guitars. Um, so I figured out most of the guitar parts. Um, so, um, okay, and then there's also some drums in here, too. So, kind of busy, but you can hear those are the guitar parts that are actually in the final version. Um, I'm not sure why these are doubled. I think they're different, maybe it's different microphones because these are the same parts. But there's basically three guitar parts here that, that all interact together. So here's the... And then here's the second one. I like to work with like really simple things that work together to make something complicated. As instead of trying to come up with a complicated idea from the, the outset, just or onset or however you <laughs> say that, um, just because I think that then you can strip things down and find which elements work well together. So here's the third part. Um, but these all ended up working well together, and then of course there's guitar harmonics. These ones are on electric guitar. And then I have a slide part in here too. I'll, I'll need some of these other ones. So it kind of sounds like a pedal steel, but it's just a slide um, on electric guitar with way too much reverb. Um, and then another layer of harmonics. And these are all kind of unedited, so together with the beat, it's a little bit busy. So we started to explore this direction a bit, but, um, and so we took that to kind of its logical end, uh, which 
is the next session here, and that's what we recorded vocals to. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, it, the, it ends up, it ended up being both. So, um, some of it was recorded with a microphone, just an SM57 in front of an amp. I have a Fender Hot Rod Deluxe. It's just like a one 12 inch speaker, um, tube amp. It sounds really nice. And then some of it was, was direct, uh, the slide guitar part and the harmonics were just, were direct and using amp simulator. Um, and, uh, so, um, let's see, I'll talk about. This, I'll show you this session. This is what we recorded vocals to. So this is this idea for Lies expanded out in its rock form before we started to decide to, to take it in a more electronic direction. Like live bass and everything. different direction than where it ended up, even though the, the sort of roots of it are kind of there. Um, but it just, you know, it wasn't totally working out in this direction. Like it sounded, we thought, oh, this is pretty good, but it just wasn't really good enough. Um, and uh, so then that's kind of when sometimes you go back to the drawing board and you're like, well, what, what do you do? So, um, oh, or take it to, an, an, uh, in this case, what we did was we recorded vocals to this because it it took us recording the vocals to it to realize that this background w wasn't really right. So I'll show you sort of our vocal session that's, um, that's a little bit uh, of an unwieldy mess, but you can see how things are laid out at least. Um, so um, what there is at the top here is a bounce of, of what we just heard. And then I have all of Amelia's vocals here. And these are actually on the same number track. So it's just all track two here. And the different takes laid out. And then I sort of you know, have this little puzzle <laughs> color coding thing of the bits that I like. So like, we could listen to the, this one full take here of this verse. Um, and it's, this is without any tuning. And it's, you know, this take's probably not that great. Let's see. When you walked away, it was the saddest day. The world has known Shattered my heart And left me with pieces Of a broken home Now you say you need me Standing at the door Asking if you can come in And I can't say no No, I can't say no so even the melody is kind of different, like different takes, she sort of did different things. Um, and so what I like to do is go through and just by, like little phrase by phrase figure out, you know, what's good and, and comp that together. And so now uh, in Logic 9 you have comping tools that make it where you don't have to do this whole grid thing like this. You can sort of do it all in one process. Um, and, and I think, you know, things like uh, Cubase and whatnot have good comping tools as well. So, but then, you know, so I ended up for each different take here, just picking out the best little bit, and then this is sort of what I ended up. Um, let's see. When you walked away, it was the saddest day that the world has known. Shattered my heart and left me with pieces of a broken home. Now you say you need me, stay. 
asking if you can come in I can't say no, no, I can't say no So, um, you know, it, it takes a while. I mean, if any of you have probably done vocal comping before, it's like you have to, it's a lot of tedious work. Even with really good singers. I mean, Amelia, like, I don't even think we captured her as well as she can be captured because um, there's something just magical about hearing her sing um, that's, that's, that can, I think is, uh, that's just even, yeah, it's really hard to capture. But, um, you know, she's great, and it's, it still takes a lot of comping to get, sort of get the best performance. Is there a question? Yeah. Yeah. Do you um, do sort of like multi-tracking with the vocals and layering them? Yeah, so the question is about multi-tracking the vocals. Like, um, so in this case, in this session that we did, we, we did record a bunch of doubles, but we didn't end up using them because it just wasn't the right thing. Like, her voice is really intimate, and it's just sound. It doesn't. It didn't sound good when you know. Because um, actually, if you know, I zoom out a bit here, you can see this session is really massive. Um, in terms of tracks, and so a lot of these were doubles, and then for the chorus part here, I cut up the doubles, like, and there's all kinds of crazy crossfading to get the timing exactly the same, so that the double, basically, what I do is the lead, it, you know, I want to sound natural. The doubles don't need to, so I can cut things off and have them fade out, and, and on its own, it can sound unnatural. It's really about how it supports the, the main vocal, but it just didn't sound right with doubling in this track. Like I think that works for like more aggressive vocals and like pop vocals, but it just um, in this case it wasn't happening really. Um, we also recorded a male vocalist for this, my friend David, that kit that I was playing earlier, um, and unfortunately it just didn't come out right. Like he was a great singer and and it was totally worth having him do it, but um, it just none of it ended up working in the song, and and that that happens too. You kind of just have to do stuff and and uh, roll with it. Um, you know, even if you, and that's a, that kind of touches on another point that I'd like to address of just that it's really easy to get attached to ideas, um, especially if they're, have any kind of merit or any kind of good to it. And it's hard to let go of them. Um, but, you know, and that's why, again, it's really important to get perspective on things because sometimes a part on its own is really cool, but it doesn't fit in the song. And so I, I, I know that, you know, with uh, Trifonic, we, that a lot of times we have, like, I hold on to parts a long time, and Lawrence will be like, "No, it's <laughs> that, that's just not going to work." And you know, and usually it's like it, that's the case; like it just doesn't work. But you get attached to your ideas. And I see that a lot, also when you know, with like like students and things, and hearing people's demos and stuff like that. It's like you know, people will have some cool thing, but it just doesn't fit. You know, it's like they just threw it in there, um, and that's. Uh, but that's really easy to do. It's hard. It's very hard to to just, especially if if it's actually a cool part on its own to not just like throw it in there because it's cool, but if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. So um, so that was sort of the case with the vocals here. Like actually some of David's vocals are all right, but they just didn't fit and it didn't, they didn't work together with Amelia's. So um, ended up having to, to make that um, not happen. So, um, so this is just sort of normal comping. There's nothing that I need to talk too much about it, but what I want to do is show you the effects. Um, not on this particular session, but Amelia also sang on a song, Broken. And so I'm going to show you the broken effects section because the, uh, the vocal effects, because the vocal effects on that are super cool. And I, I actually use them in a lot of other stuff. Like I just take her wet signal, like some of the delays and things, and put them in the background of other tracks as pads or as other ambient bits. Um, so um, I'm going to go ahead and close this project. And this other session is uh, it's, it's another um, OS 9 insanity session so um what i have to do is turn off okay this is this is the problem of dealing with like old logic sessions and dealing with new computers is like making everything play nice with each other so i have to turn off this universal track mode and then after this session i have to remember to turn that back on because otherwise other things don't play back properly okay so let's see if this works um so this is the amelia effects session from broken um, and, and uh, so basically so I have her dry vocals like um, in this red here so you can just hear uh, let's see this house is cold and empty just a ghost of who I, I used to be then underneath 
I've got this kind of stuff happening, which I really like, and I used on a bunch of stuff. So that I, what I did was take certain words and put them onto whole separate tracks. Again, this goes back to even the first thing I was talking about, those clicks and spreading them out on different tracks for different processing. Because it sometimes like just putting one reverb or delay on a vocal isn't, it's just kind of boring. Um, it depends on the context. But if it's electronic music where the sound design is, is part of it, then you want to treat the vocals in the same way as the rest of your sounds and not just plop them on top of like your electronic track. So I wanted to design the vocals while maintaining a naturalness. So um, I'd cut out certain words like that, you know, she says used to be, so B, and then this is the echo from that, um, but it's reversed. Um, and dude, I do a bunch of different layers of that on different tracks, like there's other vocal effects too, like, uh, let's see. Just try with different settings. Um, and uh, Echo Farm is really great, like the line six one is really nice, you can get, I got really nice echoes from that. Like those kind of background parts, which uh, this is probably a larger audio file here. Um, yay, it didn't crash. Um, so let's see. So yeah, this is just like an echo. Uh, I got the something soloed here. Oh, look at all these highlighted tracks. Okay. Um. So you can sort of hear the end of her word there, the very beginning, and then it's just an echo that was automated to feedback. And then I just ended up using a little bit of it. Um, and uh, so really designing basically the effects in this, so the, the wet effects. So let's see, so together with her vocals, it's kind of like. V. You know, and have it in like whatever musical element came in there, it sort of leads up to it. So it's thinking of ways to make it dynamic. Um, and uh, let's see what other background. So just reflection, I just have a little different different speed echo too. So you couldn't just do this with one delay. Um, and then I've got another one here. And that's recognize me. That's just this is just the wet signal of that. Um, and on let's see on this other track here, I've got other ones. But I, I really like this process for vocals. So, and, and I ended up using these sounds a lot in other things. Um, let's see, there's a couple other good ones in here. Like that one. Oh, I love this sound. I use this a lot, too. It's a really moody echo. Um, no, that, so these were, um, because this was an OS 9 and it's using Pro Tools hardware, this would be, the reverb would be deverb, because that's, <laughs> that's the only one I have. Uh, in terms of that, but the delays are, I have like Echo Farm, and um, I had a, a Sound Toys Pitch Blender. Um, Sound Toys plugins, by the way, are really great. Like the, I have the native bundle um, for uh, now for like Echo Boy and all that. Like they just their delay effects and their filter stuff is really great. Um, yeah, and the reverb and all this is, is just deverb, which is just comes with it. Um, So just lots of echoes and and trying to do different different types of of, of wet effects, um, and so lies I didn't do as much of that because the track is more busy. So that's why I just wanted to show broken as in, in an as a approach possibly to to you know um, customizing your effects on vocals. I mean obviously you can ride the level of a reverb or delay, um, and you can ride the level like if you had a bunch of different sends. Um, with different reverbs and delays, you could do the same thing. Like this is kind of an inefficient way of, of doing that and wouldn't necessarily recommend it. I'd probably, nowadays I'd just do it with buses, like just have um, uh, buses sending to aux tracks that all have different reverbs and delays and different delay times and reverb times and then automating the amount going to those sends. And then maybe keeping, like printing a version as audio that's just the wet track so that you can you know, have things cut off instantly, like you know, have a reverb or delay instantly cut off at a musical moment, but um, but yeah, just having a variety of vocal effects I think is definitely definitely cool. Um, so let's see here. And now I have to remember to switch this back on. Universal track mode. 
Okay, so um, after we had the vocal session with Amelia, um, we were like, okay, we need to rethink this. So um, we decided to uh, go around the house and bang stuff um, and record it and see if that inspired anything. So, uh, so I think Lawrence is doing the banging. I was doing the recording, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, so that's the cabinet. Uh, and then let's see. More cabinet stuff. Lots of them, I guess. It's different. That was the tea kettle, I think, with w some water in it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yes, question? No, no. So, this was, uh, we have like one of those micro track, the M Audio micro track thing. It's just, it's like a portable recorder. Um, and it has like a little microphone that comes with it. That's, I mean, it's just a cheapo, but it's a stereo mic, and it, it sounds fine for this sort of stuff. Um, and and for vocals too, we like we never use SM57. It's like because the range on that's really limited. It's good. It's a dynamic mic. It's good for like guitars and things, but for like a female vocal or something, it's too like we use a condenser mic. Uh, Audio Technica AT4050, I think, is, is or the 4040, one of those. Um, so went around the house, uh, <laughs> yeah. But this is where all the clicks that you hear in the song lies, like all those clicks in the high end in the background, um, all started from some kind of sounds around the house, um, bottles and things. Uh, I mean, and this goes on for like there's a radio, uh, let's see, light switches and things. So anyway. Don't need to bore you with all the details of that, but um, so the next session is where we we had cut that into a kit and started to explore programming like some kitchen sounds and things into um, making a new background for the track. So now this first version of it's pretty pretty weak, but you got to start somewhere. So. So anyway, here's the little beat that we made from the kitchen stuff. And there's like some light bulb, you can hear it, like light bulb filament rattling in there, you know. And it kind of works, but it's kind of like stomp or something, or like some 90s, like, or like some, you know, n commercial where it's like bouncing, basketball bouncing, and like, I don't know. It's it, like just this rhythm, that's all, like, it's just like, you know. I mean, I kind of like it now, maybe. But um, didn't didn't really work for this track. Uh, uh, still kind of in the rock direction, but this was the beginning of like new journey um, in this. So so what I did was I printed stems from that like before like the session that we recorded vocals to, so that I could and just started a new session from scratch where I was like, all right, let me rethink this, and I pulled in some of those things like the bass and that distorted guitar, and you know it was like, okay, l let's see what I can. Um, do with this, um, and so this was that first step in that direction, although certainly nothing profound. Um, and uh, let's see. So um, then what I did was I started, I took it to OS 9 and really did some serious editing, so I'll show you that. So I have, again have to do this universal track mode thing so that it plays it back properly. Uh, so I can't wait to just be only making music on my latest computer and not have to like ever trek back to these old computers and deal with like moving stuff between computers and it can really be a nightmare it's like to like these sessions just don't open up like on outside of their original computer and properly i mean they, they it's like i can it you know it mostly opens i can demonstrate it but it's uh I, i'm not anymore really i haven't um i recently got an imac uh, like one of the new ones, and it's it's really it's a lot more powerful. I had a G5 before that was like you know lasted five years, which is a really good long time for computer life. But um, yeah, so the iMac is much, mu I mean, it's so much faster. It's unbelievable. So um, and with Logic 9 and being able to do the like whole flex audio, that's what that's what made me sort of realize I was like, all right, this could save me a lot of time and just everything. So that's sort of what happened.